Okay. Swooping in from out of space on a Saturday. There's a large black thing in the sky. It's big. It's extremely big. It's bigger than a 339. It's four more than a 339. It's a th no, it's, it's bigger than a 339, but it's smaller in number. It's a 335, and it's a Hepiphone. One of the ones with the kind of, what do they call them? Egghead type doofers, headstocks. ES335 Pro, great looking thing. One of those lighter colored, I've forgotten the name of it, you know that lighter colored fingerboard stuff. And then we've got a, um, a couple of pull, push pull pots here. Um, and it's just, yeah, being black, it's impossible to keep dust off it, so there's dust on it already. Um, hmm, so this is Joseph's guitar, and it's sent down for a setup. Um, the nut is, of course, plastic nut that nobody wants, although the first fret action is cut really well, or cut low, I should say. Um, but it's going to get changed out for a... Tuscified nut, of which I've got one of two over there. In fact, one to go, one to go on here, and one to go to Brad in Australia to replace the one that I sent him two months ago that never arrived. So next stop, Royal Mail uh, complaints department and whatever compensation they pay for those things. Okay, so this is a Saturday night special. Um, along with the 339, it's a good oldie-fashioned set up. Um, I think, I, from a first play, I think the frets on here are pretty good. Um, but what I think the problem is, is with... Sorry. Fret buzz all the way up. Now somebody said um, on a YouTube video, play it with a plectrum and the fret buzz go, fret slap goes away. don't think so. I love those people who come up with, oh, it's you idiot. If you only played it with a plectrum, all of that would go away. Duh. And of course, it doesn't. So thank you for that piece of ungenuine unwisdom. So um, what we're going to do is replace the bridge with the roller bridge. And um, the reason for that replacement is because like so many of these guitars, the G, the G, hello there, sorry about that. Can you see how the G is st sticking <laughs> considerably higher up than all the rest? Um, I know they're meant to come up into a peak, right, and then they come down again, but it's, it's still too high, it's out of sequence, and it's so common on these things. I don't know whether they thought that was what they were aiming for, or or something went wrong, or it's just the crudeness of the the construction and how they put those things, the saddles into the block, I don't know. Either which way, it's coming off and a roll of saddles going on. Um, partly the roll of saddle is good because it gives it, um, it gives it a greater, uh, what do you call it? Great um, 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 travel. Um, intonation room, that's the thing I'm looking for. Now, one of the things uh, I didn't notice about this, foolishly, is this is in fact chrome, and that is in fact nickel. And I went ahead and bought a chrome one. So I think I'm always using these, so I think I will. I will keep this one and I will do the setup part of this thing without this one and I'll order, in fact I'm probably better off doing it now, but I'll order a, I'll order a, a nickel one which will put this back a little bit, but that's my mistake. Um, it's a shame to, to, to um, do that. So anyway, meantime, so that's, uh, yeah, that's slowed it down. I mean, the, the thing is I can, I can re, I can finish this. Uh, put the strings on and um, finish the setup. Just knowing that we've got that slight uh, 
G string that's too high. And then when the bridge comes in just before sending, I will um, change and dispatch. There you go, look, that's what I just love. String breaks straight off. So that's a pain. That's going to cost me a string from a set of nines somewhere to do the setup. Uh, it's fairly common that. Oh, here's a, here's a fake nine that came with a kit guitar. Let's put that on. Yeah, it's annoying that because the E string often does that. Just it's had enough being wound around, I think. That's the main thing. Um, anyway. Yes, that will teach me to judge chrome instead of nickel. But like I say, having a spare one of these bridges here is not a bad thing at all because most of the time I use chrome ones. Okay, so as I've said in many of these setup videos, the Epiphone is a great guitar, most of them are, because the way they put their nuts on, or let's put it another way, the way they fit their nuts is the way they should be done. Um, well, it's less uh, less the way they fit the nuts, more the way that they do the finish on the body, because on cheaper Chinese-made, some Chinese-made guitars, um, the manufacturer tends to make the guitar the wood part of the guitar, then they put the nut on the shelf, and then they do the finish. So they must mask off the nut or whatever. But they manage to always spray the finish up the front of the nut or the back of the nut and that glues the nut in place which means when you come to remove it like I just did quite often what happens is the um, is the nut that looks feels a little bit wobbly the nut um, when it comes off uh, the, the finish breaks with it um, and as a result you get a great big splitting off of the finish on the front of the headstock which is horrendously bad news <laughs> Um, such to a point now that when I come to um, do the nut on the on guitars like this now, I'm very often uh, end up getting my where's it gone mm, my razor saw. Um, I think this razor saw, and very often I end up physically cutting in to the finish this way because it's better to cut a, f a controlled line with a razor saw. <laughs> than it is to um, uh, to risk it. Um, but with the Epiphones, that's great because they don't have that problem. They're, they're well made from the start. So what I'm going to do while the strings are off, I'm going to paint the, the frets with um, mas masking, <laughs> that stuff, marker pen, um, just because I've got the strings off right now and I'm going to put another one on. Um, so we'll get this done. And then I'll put the strings back on over the loose nut. It's just placed there for the time being. Make sure it's all lined up the way I want it. Now I know from previous experience that these um, Epiphone height, nut height, uh, or the slot depth or the shelf depth, you might say, is just perfect for the base that I've made or that um, I've had made with 3D printer. So it's a very good mixture or pairing, um, which means that with these Epiphones I can just pretty much, I do a little bit of sanding on the front face to keep it flush, but then um, it pretty much goes, drops in, so it's a real true meaning of the word drop in. Okay, let's find the thinnest string out of this lot here, if I can, it's going to be that one. Um, yeah, so... Um, so very little uh, modification needed. Like I say, just a bit of flush sanding on the front edge to get it to go up against the end of the nut um, snugly. Right, so a sort of relatively cheap um, string from a kit guitar just to go on straight away and uses a sacrificial string. It's a shame about 
It's amazing how much or how often just turning that E string tuner causes the string to break when it's been on a long time. It's like it's um yeah, it's like it's stressed to its kind of giving up point and then it just goes as soon as you move it one direction or another it pops and goes conks out. The the other strings are similarly um, stressed but they're thicker so they tend not to break so easily. Okay so the first thing I'm going to do with this nut in place it's as I expect it's starting with the strings all flush or, or lying on the first fret so to get the action we want we just raise it up off the first fret um, and it's as much or li as little as one prefers. Um, on these I always flat sand the um, grub screw, bottom of the grub screws that are in here. Flat sand them so that it increases their surface area and makes them a little bit less um, sticky into the plastic-y-ish. Right, I'm going to put this under um, and tune it. Now having unslacked off the strings a little bit, then there will be some slack in there. It's probably worth just stretching out a little bit before we begin the we'll get ready for the fret leveling process. So I just want it um, tuned to load the neck. Okay, so that's that bit. Let's take off the extra bit of string that annoys me. With this guitar, headstock's looking a bit grubby. So what I'll do with this, I'll take the tuners off and clean the headstock up on this one. Um, okay, <clears throat> so with this here, we'll ignore the G string stand out. It's not going to make uh, that much difference, although it will make a tiny difference to how high it sits at this end, but we'll, we'll work the height of all the other strings and not the G string, and so it seems alright down that end. So the first thing I want to do is check the um, neck relief, and it's very, very flat. It's almost completely flat. In fact, on the treble side, there's no relief at all. So, it's probably a tad more than we would want. We want some. My m m maxim is some relief. So what I would suggest is we turn a tiny bit counterclockwise. I'm just looking down here to get a feel for these frets anyway. Um, yeah, tiny bit counterclockwise. We can change it all the time. That's not the problem. And we're a little fraction more. Okay, so so what we've got, let's check now the last fret action. Um, now I haven't adjusted it since it came, so it looks really low as it is. Wow, it is very low. Um, we've got <coughs> excuse me, we've got about 1.3 there, and we we're down on the base side to one mil. That's too little, I'm afraid, for this guitar. Um, Maybe 
yeah you might get away with it just but it's very very low um, obviously that's going to slightly change the tuning now one of the things that I want to know to know what the notes are like So straight away, notes-wise, they all play. Um, they're a little bit mushy and a bit of fret slap type of noise on quite a few of them, and particularly on the lower strings, which is quite common. What we also want to know is that these strings bend, which I'm finding more and more on Epiphones, they do. So what I'm, conclusion, I have to just blow my nose because I'm going to sneeze otherwise. Conclusion <coughs> on this um, Epiphone, like many others, is that, is that it's, um, frets are pretty good uh, and there's really only an issue with fret slap, which considering how low this action is and how flat the neck still is, it's not surprising, it's quite a challenging action to have <coughs> and I'd expect it to be doing that little bit of fret slap. Now the idea, the aim we'll aim for now, what we'll go for, is we will, or I will aim to level this out, <coughs> excuse me, just with fret slap in mind. So I'm not thinking about um, freeing up any notes, the bends all work. I'll be thinking about checking the overall straightness and bumpiness of this neck um, and clearing up any little hillocks. Because what I've discovered over time is that, yes, there are problems caused by obviously blatantly uneven frets and that they're quite extreme and that fret leveling, as we know, takes care of that insofar as it removes the high peaks of uneven frets or tall frets and also we know that um, where there are low frets it, it or particular low fret <coughs> we can this the fret leveling leveling process allows us to kind of gently bottom out the lowest fret so that the others around it don't buzz and choke um, because a, a low fret makes the next one high and you, you have to bottom out everything in a nice shared way in order to get rid of the effect of that low individual fret. But what I've found out over time is that there are those issues which we kind of know about or that, that are easy to fix and spot. But on these necks there is another problem which this tool also fixes or goes a long way to fixing. I don't, I'm not so, I'm not going to claim it totally fixes it. I think it goes a long way to fixing it. And that's this thing I call fret slap. And fret slap is caused, my term, is caused by the strings not having, when they're being fretted, not having quite enough room to spin without clipping the frets. And, they, and the thing that you can tell where there's fret slap, this is a good example here. Same noise on every fret. Kind of a, you might not be able to hear, you probably hear the louder bit at the body, but there's a little fizz down at this end. Um, and fret slap, you'll hear it 
often on three quarters, half or three quarters, or even sometimes a whole fretboard on a single string going all the way up. And that's definitely not a single high fret. But it's it's caused by what I found is by the neck being slightly bumpy in sometimes four or even five different patches. When that happens, it, the bumpiness um, where the peaks are creates a little blockage for the string to hit. Um, and we have to take, so we, so I guess when we're doing individual frets, we're leveling out one fret and its neighbor, between one fret and its neighbors. When we're leveling for fret slap, we are ironing out the ups and downs across the whole board, or across the board as a whole. And it's funny because it's the same process, but it feels like two different activities. So for example, because I'm not aiming, I'm not aiming to level any problematic individual frets here. I'm going to start out by aiming or targeting the fret slap from the outset. So that's that's going to be the first thing I'm aiming for. So that means what what does that mean practically? Well, it means practically I'm doing the same thing as before. I'm aiming to calibrate the truss rod so that it m it mirrors the curve in the neck, however slight it is, and it's very very slight in this case. There's about right. And when it comes to doing the leveling, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use it very, very lightly because I'm not after a single fret. Um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to allow the curve of this, this uh, flexible truss rod, or quite stiff truss rod actually, I'm, I'm aiming to have it, inverted commas, impose itself onto the um, underlying hills and valleys. So obviously, if it's got hills and valleys, I'm, I'm evidently going to be looking for it to take down the hills and bottom out the valleys, really. So the first bit of um, leveling I do tells me something straight away. So it's cutting, cutting, not cutting, not cutting, not cutting, cutting a little bit, cutting a little bit, cutting more, 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 about the same, hardly any, none, none, tiny bit, none, none, tiny bit, tiny bit, a little bit more, a little bit more, but not much on the edge. So it, when I just glance at this, I can see high there, lowish there, high there, lowish to about there, and then high the last three, but not right at the edge. So you can see that there's already four, uh, one, two, three, actually five zones. And it's typical that I find about five zones on every single neck. Now, I'm, a con I'm conscious that this one isn't cutting right on the edge of some of these frets, but it's cutting just inside. So it sort of tells me that the edges are lower down. Um, and that can be caused by a change in the shape of the wood or it can, the underlying wood, or it can be caused by um, how the frets are seating on the wood itself. Um, I used to think when I found low frets, my first instinct was that they were hammered in harder or pressed in harder than anything else. And you can get that. You can create low frets by pressing too hard with the fret press or with your hammering. Um, because the distances of the, the amounts are so tiny. But then I started to notice that they were in clusters of two or three. That rattle is a bit of the bridge rattling. Um, yeah, when I noticed they were in clusters of two and sometimes three or more, um, and I realized that what I was looking at was more than likely, rather than somebody over pressing two frets in a row, more than likely what I was looking at was a slight variation in the board. And what I know about wooden necks is that when you compress them <coughs> longitudinally, they not only try to curve upwards because the headstock's trying to pull up um, but principally they're trying to compress long ways um, and that makes the, well it compresses the wood and it makes the wood do things slightly differently than you'd expect. So I'm happy with how that was playing and that first pass on the E track has given me a sort of sighting of what I sort of, I sort of knew. I knew that there were some low ones up here and I knew that there were a couple of choked out notes round about here and I'm pretty sure there were some really noisy ones down here and that's co that coincides with what appears on this side of the radius, certainly at least. We may find it extends to here, but 
if this side of the, the neck radius is anything to go by, then we already know these are low, and that would explain why when we press the E string into this dip, it'll make the frets afterwards get in the way because it's going, it's not that they're high, it's just that this one, these three are in a dip, and that's what this system is able to show. Now I'm moving across to the B track, and I haven't recalibrated because I used the first calibration for the first two tracks, because I can't really calibrate it outside. Normally I calibrate to the north of the string, but there's nothing to rest on there. So I do the first one south of the E string, and I make it count for the north of the B string calibration as well. It seems to work okay. So again, I'm just mo mainly letting gravity do its thing, and I'm trying not to press too hard. However, when, when I st start to notice where problems, issues, I can start to um, push a little in certain areas to help level things out. So again, cutting, not cutting at all, cutting a little bit. So we've definitely got a dip here in the in around frets three and four, which makes notes played around here, certainly on the low strings, makes these notes um, quite buzzy. Uh, cutting quite heavily or more heavily up here, so we've got a high spot, defini definite high spot here. Um, and then it goes low again here, and I'm not really seeing much cutting until we get down to the last three again. So quite a big low patch here from the 12th fret, I'd say 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 17, 13 to 17 are quite low. So you can see that, it, again, it's reconfirming what the first um, leveling pass told me. So now I kind of check these out. Now here we've got spring rattle, thanks to these stupid bridges. I'm going to ignore that. String rattle on the bridge. God, it's annoying. These, these are terrible bridges, I hate them. All of that rattle I can hear there is, a, is from the bridge, which is another reason why I can't stand the tunematic bridge. Um, I'm comfortable with that right now. I'm going to recalibrate now on, to work on the G track. Now remember the G track we know is sitting a little, the string's sitting a tiny bit higher than it should be at the moment, but it doesn't have any impact on this activity. It's, it's the same. It makes no difference. It's, it's still under load, the neck is still doing what it should be doing at this point, and the frets aren't related to how high the saddle is, so there's no real concern about that. So here I go again, just kind of almost gravity um, pushing, maybe, you know, there's a tiny bit of, of downward force in the middle, of course, but, you know, this is none of this is scientific, it's it's touch and feel from experience more than anything else. And sometimes when I describe it in all these videos, it is a bit like magic at times. Um, but while it is like magic, it certainly isn't mumbo jumbo. It's, it's, there's a solid logical point or principles behind it, but um, how you interpret what, or how you feel what's going on Um, can can feel see we've got a little bit of that buzz there see that zzz, zzz. that's because we're in the ditch there now what I'm going to do for this G string now is I'm going to come back to it I'm happy with where it is elsewhere and I'm going to press down a little bit on this end and that's because I want to try and just level out a little bit strings uh, frets three and four or sorry the ones either side and actually i've managed to do it so i'm now just touching frets three and four with the file which means we're kind of bottoming out that little discrepancy and the zizz is gone mostly a little tiny bit there but not much so I'll do a tiny bit more on the whole G track and then we'll move onwards. 
and it's the it's when we get to the um, the lower strings that <coughs> you can often really hear a difference. So I'm just putting a little bit more pressure on these lower ones to cure that problem, and then I'm going to just lighten up and spread the leveling over the rest whoop, over the rest of them. <sighs> um, So should be good. Yes, now let's listen to the D track. So, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 17, 18, 19, um, are they the low ones? Yes, they are, that's thought as much, and down here, still low. So, the D track, we're going to recalibrate now and work that, knowing that we've got a low spot down here on 2 and 3 and on 17 to 19 up here. But it's consistent, showing itself to be fairly consistent. Now, this... Um, curvature has changed slightly so we just need to put a tiny bit of extra load into this to curve the beam a little bit more and it's so small an amount you can hardly even see how much it is so we're going to do the D track and onwards so I'm kind of expecting to see nothing cutting Probably nothing cutting in the um, three, uh, three and four. Actually, three is cutting now. That's good. So it's, it's sort of leveling out a little bit as we come across this way. And everything's cutting. That's good. 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 Not much here. <clears throat> Not much in this chunk here-ish. So what I'll probably end up doing is doing this and then put just a little bit of extra downward pressure at this end to help bring down the, the overall set of frets. And because there's a lot of frets here in, in one place, it, it's a little bit harder to remove the material. It takes a little bit more work because you've got much closer frets. The tiniest bit right in the middle, I would say. And then, I mean, I'm being very finicky here, but we might as well. So a da little bit of downward pressure on this bit here. And then that's done for the D track. And then we go on to the A. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, fourteen, thirteen to seventeen. And this lower part here. So we we'll calibrate, recalibrate for the A track. So what I'm doing here, recalibrating, is just making sure or checking first of all to see if the curve in the rod is the same as the curve in the neck going this way, the relief curve. And it changes microscopically between tracks, if you like, and I make a tiny adjustment each time to get as close as I can to it. Um, so here we go into the A track. And again, I'm going to start with a light touch, partly because it's a really, it's a really good diagnostic approach. I can. The, the lightest touch will give me the best view of what's going on. So, um, um, touching, floating, touching, 
not touching, not touching. So here the low spot has kind of moved up a little bit to four and five. So we need to concentrate on that. But that's I noticed that in playing down there, it seemed to have moved up. And then we've got this whole spot up here, which is quite low. So two and five, uh, sorry, four and five, and all the way up here, 13 to about 19. So let's just press down a little bit on the old four and five area down here. See if we can just clear that out. Of course, you, you know, to, to bottom out a dip in this neck, it's obvious that it's costing fret metal um, to some amount. And that's an, another area where experience evidently will come into play. Um, and for somebody doing this uh, from new to this, it'll feel no, a bit nerve wracking. So I know I've got a very good sense of how much material this does or doesn't remove, depending how new or old the paper is and so on. Tiny bit still there. Cleaner up this end, a bit more down here. Um, yeah, so you get used to it over time. Um, and it is one of the biggest challenges when you start doing this is to is to you know to be able to read how much is too much and how little is too little because as I say you, you, you obviously I'm not dealing with a single fret here uh, I'm dealing with the fret and all its surrounds surrounding frets um, so to gently map the curve of this tool onto this neck is going to cost some in fret metal from all the frets. Um, but that is exactly how it plays out. That's exactly what we have to do. There's no, there's no way around it. Fret leveling gives you the option to have lower actions without any buzz. But You have to be prepared to trade out this one. This one, I'm slightly worried about this. This is showing up as barely over a millimeter high. So I think we are still too low on this. Uh, a target action that I would go for is 1.5 millimeters and no lower. Um, occasionally I've found that you can get to one on an SG. Um, partly because SG necks are almost entirely out of the body and they seem to um, be more flexible and responsive to the truss rod. So I'm going to come back down to here, switch this round again. So this is the bit where, you know, being able to gauge how much material is being removed, where you are in the process is pretty helpful. Um, I think like a lot of people, I have been the kind of person who would probably always wimp out first early rather than too late. So I've never taken too much metal off. I have given guitars back where I haven't taken enough off. I 
tiny I'm gonna just do a little tiny bit more in this section here yeah I've given back guitars with not enough metal taken off and therefore um, you know not quite as slap free as they could have been um, but that's just me erring on the side of caution um, which I prefer to do so so that yeah experience helps you to work that out I'm going to stop there because that's as good as I'm going to get and again I know that from experience um, there are there are occasions where a neck will just come to a point where it won't do any more whether it's the scale length the, the gauge of string or whether it's the something about the I don't know well, there's not a lot else that's at play um, but there, there comes some sometimes you come to a point where you can only get it so good um, and beyond that it's a, a law of diminishing returns which when it comes to fret metal you don't want to get stuck in uh, chasing your tail endlessly at the cost of um, fret metal so another aspect of of the experience uh, curve I suppose is is knowing when you've reached that point um, and you know not going any further calling it calling time on it just check the relief a minute still practically nothing see I suspect we we might be we might be in that sort of territory here so if for example you don't have a sensible target action which this actually currently is um, and or there's absolutely no relief which really there currently isn't on here um, it's worth at this point if you're not getting an improvement it's worth making a small adjustment in the relief uh, rather than have this thing sort of um, ruler flat and it's hardly moving at all actually there's a, there, a little bit more than there was Yeah, now that little bit of relief, that tiny bit of relief has improved that. What we can hear is in both on both the A and the E string, this these low frets here are they're they're just about starting to get leveled out, but they're not quite there yet. So I would be tempted to just do a tiny bit more in both spots. Um, and that won't be the way to do it now, will it, Samuel? That's more like it. The one in front of the low ones that tends to be the first, obviously the first in line for causing the, that little bit of choke or buzz, fret, fret slap, 
So I'm just focusing on that one for a minute, but that will be pretty much it. Um, and the thing about this is that the clearance now clearances are now so small that the tiniest movement will uh, either in you know uh, neck relief with the action up and down the tiniest amount will throw it back into slap or clear it up okay now my instincts tell me that's where I want to stop with this so what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to take off the strings which will be good to throw away can keep them for sacrificial strings but I've got quite a few packs of those uh, courtesy of Simon's sacrificial strings a long time Relove Guitars benefactor collects me up tons of weird and wonderful Chinese brand strings which are no good for playing but perfectly good for uh, sacrificial strings purposes and the reason I use those rather than old strings is because to be honest trying to straighten out old strings unless you absolutely have to is a is a bit of a breaker of buns so I'd you know I, I I'm very grateful to Simon for the luxury of being able to take some ooh, ouch, strings like this and just cut the curly ends off and then pull out the, the straight bits and bin the rest like so. Makes it so much easier and then dragging the curly bent and twisted bits out through the uh, stop bar. Okay so that's the fret leveling as far as I'm going to do it and it's just a matter of experience tells me that this combination of uh, last fret height plus uh, neck relief plus first fret height plus this guitar is optimum for this guitar so and that I you know I won't get any more from continuing to level um, if I'm seeking you know, a different kind of outcome like you know absolutely no buzz at all on anywhere it's kind of not realistic so that's not a pen so the next part of the game is I'm going to remark remarkable remark the frets with marker pen then we're going to use the stumac fret crowning file to re crown or to take off the sharp flat spots or round off the flat spots I should probably say um, that we've created by leveling but to do so in a way that we don't lower the fret tops in to any amount so that we're not changing the relative um, heights because we've gone spent quite a lot of time uh, leveling them now we don't want to go and spoil it by taking one fret down lower than all the others now I did a back-to-back -back test of a cheap Chinese so-called crowning file that uh, Martin sent me to try out and um, I did that yesterday and the cheap Chinese file unsurprisingly was complete garbage uh, it really didn't work at all um, in fact it made a complete mess I obviously tried it on a, a, a disposable neck that I keep for such test purposes um, but yeah it was uh, you know these things are always worth trying because somewhere sometimes the the Chinese made items uh, you know can be functional and if you're not hysterical about patriotism and you know arguments about supporting the wicked Chinese communist government like who doesn't buy a million Chinese things every time they go out shopping without having any say in it you know but you know there are times when some Chinese things that we can buy direct from China just make complete sense because there's no point paying ridiculously marked up prices 
for the privilege of somebody having dealt with the Chinese directly and then you pay a marked up price just for them having done the purchasing. Um, but in this case, what that file, it went into the category of, I called it a facsimile, which is a bit of an old old fashioned word. Oop, sorry about that. Um, it's a bit of an old fashioned word. Um, in the case, it's actually what the word, what the name of the fax machine came from, facsimile machine. But it means a copy, a direct, like lifelike or like for like copy. So, in the case of the Chinese file, it was a facsimile because it just was a, a visual copy. It just didn't function in the same way at all. Uh, it didn't come anywhere close to functioning in the same way. It wasn't concave the way this is. This file depends on being concave to work. Um, it wasn't, and so it didn't do what this file has to do. It just ground the top straight off your frets, which is not what you want. You want, you want the file to take the sharp edges off. Uh, it's also a fax it was also a facsimile in the sense that when you looked into the file surface you saw a load of little bobble bits um, that sort of made could make the casual viewer think that there was some sort of diamond coating or something um, but actually when you looked at it closely who knows what was on there um, it was about a thousand times bigger than the diamond particles that appear to be on the surface of here that make this file work. Um, and actually on the Chinese file, those particles would seem to be just coming off, just breaking off and littering the uh, around the frets when I worked on them, um, you know, so almost straight away. So I got have a feeling that it would be kind of bald in about one or two goes. That's if you could even punish your frets enough to use it that long um, so anyway I did that test and came to a very rapid conclusion and I uh, uploaded the video and put it on Facebook and then contacted Martin and said whatever you do don't use this on your guitars um, and I recommended him sending it back for a refund and of course being Amazon uh, it was uh, much more he was able to do that, so he sent me a. a uh, we've got a nice sunset out there for a nice day tomorrow. He sent me a, pre a packaging label. Actually, it wasn't prepaid. I have to go and put, put the payment on it, but it's got to go up to London to a Chinese named Chinese seller who will probably flog it to some other unfortunate person. But they're definitely. They're not even they're not even credible attempts to be um, uh, tools that you can use, and that's that's the annoying bit in a way. I don't kind of don't mind people manufacturers having a go, you know, especially if you know if you if you're a, a national manufacturer or you know you're a country like China and it wants to wants to play and sell in the global market, of course, and you know does so. Uh, with a few less scruples than many other, well, who knows, than, than less scruples regarding intellectual property than we think is correct for a global market. But nonetheless, I respect them wanting to make products and sell them into the West. Um, but at least, you know, try and make them uh, functional tools instead of just things at, at 100 meters look like the thing but when you get up close it's obvious that it's the person who's made it has never never crowned a guitar fret in his life his or her life so that's that's the cynical bit it's you know it knows it's it's they're smart these people they know that this tool here will set you back about 120 quid including postage because you have to buy it from Stumac in the US or and there are one or two other ones but if you go for the one that you know when you get up to that sort of money you go for the one that a you can rely on um, has a good track record and Stumac certainly does and the other thing about Stumac is their customer service has 
it's reported to be excellent. So if you got it and it really didn't do the job, or I suspect even if you thought it wasn't good value for money, I am pretty certain that they would sort you out. Um, you know, and that when you're spending that much money, that's what you want more than anything else. So the Chinese are smart in that they see the thing at 120 pounds quite rightly they conclude that's a lot of money and they know that they can position an ob you know a product somewhere way down the scale and uh, it'll be attractive enough for people to try and give it a go because the price differential is so enormous you know so I think these fake files were well, these so-called files were about 20 quid each I'm not quite sure but you know that's a hundred quid difference so you can understand people wanting to at least give it a go and of course the Chinese manufacturer is um, pretty used to the idea that some you know maybe one in ten will demand their money back and the rest will just write it off as a bad you know bad a stupid mistake anyway so what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to get ready to go into the kind of dreary part of things and that's the fret polishing um, it's just you know <laughs> when you've done it how many thousand three four five thousand times uh, it's tired you know you get a bit bored of doing it and certainly you don't want to talk through it because it's dreary and it's noisy too but anyway that's what I'm going to do I'll do it off camera while I'm off camera I'll also take the tuners off um, clean the headstock um, Joseph was talking about replacing these tuners. Um, he talked about sort of dead spots on these. I'm not sure I noticed any of that. Um, and I sus no, don't suspect, don't second guess somebody's experience. What, what I would encourage is, uh, before changing the tuners on this guitar, have a feel with the tusk nut on and see if you get that same feeling you had before. I'm... I know for a fact that when you have a crappy plastic nut and the strings don't move through it smoothly, what happens is it feels like the tuners aren't doing anything, so you turn it and you don't hear any pitch increase because it's basically taking up, it's increasing the pressure here, tension here, and it hasn't overcome the drag in the nut slot yet to equalize and pull the string through. But I think often people will experience that as uh, slop in the tuners when in fact it's the nut causing that problem so although I don't know that is exactly what is the case in Joseph's case I would suggest you know encourage before you change go straight to changing the tuners have a go with the nut the new nut and see whether you still feel you have the same experience with those tuners the point is if you feel those tuners if to you that the tuning experience feels different now then you can be sure that it's down to changing the nut and that's how big a how important a part the nut plays in things so yeah I, I, you know that china thing is is I've, I've had people comment before and um somebody commented on uh, youtube saying you know don't don't buy from the communist chinese and the, the person who commented, I think, is probably a guitar tech or luthier themselves. And, you know, that's fine. I, I, there's a, loads of times where I think things like, God, I wish I could, I wish I could stop using Amazon, for example. Or, I, or, you know, I don't like the idea of um, being dependent on the Chinese. I don't like the Chinese communist governments. You know, I don't like its historic behaviours, current and historic behaviours, and so on and so on. Uh, and in many ways, I would like not to support them. Um, but the problem is, I live in a world that my forebears have created a world in which we are dependent on Chinese manufacturing. Um, and if we were to try not to be, um, all of our industries would grind to a halt. Most of our industries, certainly if you're a tech, guitar tech or a luthier. And I wanted to say to the, the person who wrote that you know you know t honestly tell me tell me what tell me how you got 
off completely 100 percent off chinese products because i don't believe you can be um not as a, a guitar fixer upper if you look at this this you know that almost every part of this guitar comes from china um or chinese owned manufacturing or chinese owned yeah chinese owned manufacturing in in places like korea and so on and i just i honestly don't see uh have i got enough cut here i think i might have enough not to cut anymore um yeah so i, I honestly don't see the any possible way that that person writing that comment could be free from chinese manufacturing i mean uh, I mean, if I just stop and think for a minute now, is, let's say I wanted a, a guitar bridge. Where, who in Britain makes guitar bridges? Now, I'll put my hand up straight away and say, I do, because I make them out of brass. For that, there's one for that guitar there. Hold on, I'll show you. There you go. That's British industry. I made it myself. I'm not a manufacturing facility. I wanted a hardtail bridge and didn't have one. And I just dropped them a piece of tape. I didn't have one. Um, but what I did have was some uh, some brass and some, unfortunately, some Chinese-made uh, saddles. But I had some brass and I put the brass to work in making the, uh, the bridge plate. And I get great satisfaction from using brass because it's a nice material, etc., etc. But the point is, okay, so I made a bridge for myself. But apart from making it myself, the bridge, um, where would where would I go to buy a British bridge? Not so as not to patronise the Chinese Communist government. Well, the answer is nowhere. I don't think. I don't know any companies. I don't see. I don't, when I go online and Google, I don't see any luthier supplies companies with made all products made in Britain plastered all over it. They just aren't. Because guess why? Because you couldn't make a stop bar in this country for under 10 quid and people expect to get a stop bar for 10 quid you know that's the end of the sort of discussion really um anyway so yeah how you become independent of chinese manufacturing i honestly don't know but uh i would i would like to be um you know, do, do I enjoy making, would I enjoy making, well, I enjoyed making a brass bridge for me to use. Would I want to make it my business to set up in manufacturing to be a manufacturer of brass bridges to the British guitar building stroke uh, setup guitar teching industry? Well, no. Um, first of all, because I'm not, a, I'm not a, manufacturer by by inclination you know I'm a, I'm a guitar setter upper an occasional builder hand builder but um, you know am I have I set out to build up a manufacturing plant um, you know with a well, manufacturing facility with Know, big equipment and automation and and computerization and so on and so forth well the answer is no um that doesn't mean that other people couldn't be and that you know we in this country couldn't get back to a manufacturing base but can you imagine restarting that from scratch to with a view to become a player in the world manufactory of guitar components you know, cheap guitar components to the to the uh, market. You know, who all of whom currently have grown up on getting things as cheap as they want them to be. Um, so I think we've got a real, <laughs> real challenge, real problem in that way. Um, so to the person who commented, you know, I'd love to not be so dependent on Chinese goods, but I'm realistic, and I don't think I could. I wouldn't be here on this Saturday night doing this as my primary you know income that pays the rent um, if I was buying a stop bar that cost 65 pounds because it took a skilled
person 45 minutes to make or something, you know, or, or it's made in Sheffield or something. I mean, much as I'd love to be able to buy a British made thing, we don't have that sort of low cost manufacturing base. Um, so there you go. I mean, how the heck would somebody do it, even those who are very committed to not buying Chinese? I don't think they really can be. Anyway, so I'm going to clean this after I've done the sanding out. Um, so I'm just going to cover these pickups just a little bit. I kind of only do this one really to stop it getting caught by the sandpaper. Um, the dust never goes sticks on the pickups as far as I've ever been able to see. People worry about it. They go, why don't you this? And Well, it's because they never have stuck onto the pickups and you can if you do have any dust or anything particles on the pickups you can remove it just by um, pulling on it with some sticky tape it's it's uh, this stuff here is not very f f f ferrous not very magnetic anyway it's about six percent magnetic as magnetic as steel or iron so it's very little okay so I'm going to do the fret Polishing, go through with all my different grades of papers, followed by my micro meshes. And then when that's done, I'll take it all off, clean it all off again, and it'll be time to uh, oil the fingerboard and put some new strings on. Um, in this case, with the, um, I'll do it with the original bridge again. And then I'll take the guitar home and I'll do the changeover and the final intonation at home. Just because this isn't an easy guitar, I don't have a 335 case at the moment. So right now, it's uh, it, I have to be very careful transporting it. So the, the fewer times I bring it up and back to the workshop is better. Um, I can safely store it on a guitar hanger at home, safely out of harm's way. So that's what I'll do. So it'll be most of the setup done. But the intonation on those roller bridges is usually spot on. But unfortunately, my not noticing that it was nickel instead of chrome has cost us, I'm afraid, a couple of extra days. Um, I should probably be able to have it ready to send midweek at the latest for a Thursday delivery. But I had it all. That's why I'm up here now, because I had it all in mind to have complete today and dispatch Monday for a Tuesday. But there we go. The best laid plans and all of that okay my sequence of papers okay i'll put you on hold i'll go and listen to some boring radio or exciting radio while i do this and then i'll see you shortly okay we're back after the I don't like that. I'm not going to say that. We're back after the polishing out of the frets and the oiling of the board, the cleaning of the headstock and the cleaning of the whole body. So it is now time to fit the strings and we won't stretch them thoroughly on this go because I'm going to sort of leave that to when we've put the other bridge on. But... Um, Let's start. So my recommendation is always with the adjustable nut, start with the um, the D and the G string. So that's what I'm beginning with, the D. So we come up to the end here, put it all the way through. I've glued the nut down now, by the way. So pull it all the way through, pull it back one fret's worth, I'm holding on to the other string while I'm doing this, Hold back, pull back one fret's worth and then wind on and hold the tight string above the loose string first time round and as it comes round the second time yank up the loose string and push the held string underneath and that will hold the adjustable nut insert into place so I won't we're going to risk it running off somewhere. Now we do the G. It would help if I put these in place. Now, 
the secret of tuning stability is two things. And two things definitely and one thing it definitely isn't. So the first thing it definitely it definitely isn't down to is your tuners. I should have a kind of some sort of music for a shock horror sound effect at that point. Nope, it has tuning stability has to do with the quality or condition of your nut slots and the amount of slack in your strings. So that's why I've always put so much effort into getting the nut slots right, including laterally, um, always using tusk now and making my own adjustable nuts, which means um, the real benefit of making using an adjustable nut is that I can um, use, use a tusk nut without doing anything to the nut slots. I can use them in pristine factory condition. So that, plus the material in the tusk nut itself, the PTFE or um, Teflon, I suppose, that plus the untrammeled uh, slots in the nut give you the perfect nut situation. So that's half of the tuning stability equation. The other half of the equation is stretching out the, the uh, slack in your strings. And that is achieved by one thing and one thing only. <sighs> There's no magic solution or no magic bullet for this. You have to physically um, stretch that slack out. And it's a lot more, it takes a lot more to do that than people think. So I know I've heard people in the past talk about things like um, uh, you know, just tuning up half a tone and then giving it a pull and then hope, you know, by the tomorrow it will be, uh, you know, down, it will be stretched out and stabilised. Well, you can think the strings are stabilised, but I can promise you that the slack that is still in the strings will continue to leach out, shall we say, when you're playing for anything up to a couple of years afterwards, certainly from one string change to the other, you'll never get rid of that uh, slack. And it will con consistently and continually go out of tune a little bit. Um, if you have a, the nut slots in bad condition, it'll go out of tune a lot in conjunction with the uh, unreleased slack in the string. So it's, it's one of the most important things. And when you understand it and do it, um, and hopefully, well, I'm pretty certain, I'm pretty confident actually, that just about everyone who's had this setup with particularly with this tusk nut upgrade and um, you know right down to the roller bridge and uh, the strings uh, the strings fully stretched out um, I know how amazed people are at the tuning stability after that you know it's a it's like a revelation so there's it puts a, it makes a bit of a myth out of a lot of the stories we tell ourselves and each other about what causes tuning instability. Um, you know, one of the biggest, of course, is being, oh, well, you know, your tuning isn't stable, so you need to go and buy 80 pounds, 100 pound set of tuners. And it really is not that at all. There are good reasons for upgrading tuners, um, in part because uh, the cheaper they are, the cruder the gearing mechanism is, and the less precise they are when you operate them. Um, these are typically 15 to 1 gearing ratio, which is not very high, but it's not the cheapest, and it's certainly adequate for the job. Um, going higher to an 18 or 19 to 1 ratio, just 